Okay, everybody, welcome to the podcast on male and female reproductive anatomy. This goes hand in hand with a lot of what we've discussed about the urinary system up to this point because a lot of these structures are shared in the male and female anatomy, and you'll see why when we look at our first figure. This is the sagittal section through the male pelvic region. And um, essentially, uh, if we look, starting at the exterior structures and work our way in, what we see here is the scrotum, which is a, a pouch that hangs underneath the penis, which contains the testes, which are where sperm are produced. The testes, of course, also manufacture testosterone, which governs male secondary sex characteristics such as axial and body hair, increased hematocrit, bone density, and muscle mass, um, and um, deepening of the voice. You can also see here the epididymis, which is an extension of the coiled tubes that are inside the testes called the seminiferous tubules, this is where the sperm that are produced by the testes go to learn how to use their flagella. So you could think of this as swimming school for the sperm. Coming out of the epididymis is a tube that will conduct the sperm ultimately to the urethra. This is the vas deferens. So we'll trace the vas deferens up through um, the scrotal sac back inside the abdominal pelvic cavity and then it winds around here. It passes the ureter and then it opens up into a widened region called the ampulla and it joins the prostatic urethra at the ejaculatory duct along with the secretions that come from this gland called the seminal vesicle. There are four glands that contribute components to semen. The seminal vesicle is one, the testes are another, the prostate gland of a third, and this gland right here, the bulbo-urethral gland, is the fourth. As the ejaculate passes through the ampulla into the prostatic urethra, the seminal vesicle and the prostate gland add their components to the semen, and the bulbo-urethral gland, which has already um, produced secretions that have uh, worked their way along the male urethra, adds its secretions to the ejaculate. The ejaculate will then come through the ejaculatory duct here into the prostatic urethra, from there into the membranous urethra, and from there into the penile or spongy urethra, and then from here to the outside of the body. Now what you'll notice uh, also are a few other structures that we already touched on, the bladder and the ureter, okay, which are components of the urinary system, the bladder empties into the urethra and remember that the male has three parts of the urethra, the prostatic, the membranous here, and the penile. So in the male, the urethra serves as a passageway for both urine and semen. You can also see in the penis three columns of vascular tissue. This is the corpus spongiosum here. This is the corpora cavernosa. There are two corpora cavernosa on the dorsal side of the penis, on the left and the right dorsal side, at one corpus spongiosum, which encases the penile urethra, sometimes called the spongy urethra. The glands is essentially the head of the penis, and the foreskin is known as the prepuce. And very often um, in um, children born in the U.S., the prepuce is removed in an operation called a circumcision which is performed for hygienic reasons because we don't want bacteria growing in the crevice between the glands and the prepuce. When um, ejaculate is um, ready to be produced, ready to be um, sent to the urethra, uh, what will happen is that the bladder will essentially close off uh, and the semen will have the right of way. Now. You can also see here the pubic symphysis, which is the anterior midline of where the coxal bones meet. The, the uh, bones 
the, the component of the coxal bone that meets here at anterior midline is called the pubis. And this is an amphiarthrotic joint, meaning that it is slightly movable. You can also see the rectum and the anus. There's the anal opening. And one of the things that we should point out while we're looking at this diagram is the fact that we worry about um, cancer cells developing in this region because of the proximity of these structures to the inguinal lymph nodes. So we're concerned about testicular and prostate cancer for this very region. And so one of the things that we do in men that are over the age of 35 for an annual checkup is we do a digital prostate exam by palpating the prostate through the rectum and anus. And we also do a PSA test. PSA stands for prostate specific antigen. And it can be an early indicator of uh, metastasis taking place in the organ. Testicular cancer, we can check. Uh, there are blood tests we can check. We can also palpate and we can do, um, we can do imaging uh, to see if there's a mass. Um, but again, the reason that we concern ourselves so much is because of the proximity of these structures to uh, the inguinal lymph nodes. Okay. Um, the shaft of the penis um, leads backwards from the glands and then the bulb of the penis is this area here the part that is closest to the body uh, and it's part of what gives the bulbourethral gland its name notice that the bulbourethral gland is near the urethra and the bulb of the penis hence its name so the path of sperm through the uh, male reproductive system runs from the testes to the epididymis okay, to the vas deferens from the vas deferens it fuses with the seminal vesicle then through the ejaculatory duct we hit the prostatic urethra uh, and then from the prostatic urethra we go to the membranous urethra and then to the spongy urethra and then we head out through the uh, tip of the spongy urethra which is embedded in the glands and then we're outside the body and one of the things that you want to do when you're in lab or when you're reviewing this material in preparation for the final is to take a look at what a cross-section through a seminiferous tubule looks like under a microscope and we'll get a chance to see some of that now if we were to take the testy and we were to section it what we would see are the structures that contain the cells that undergo spermatogenesis. The stem cells that are continuously dividing to generate sperm are called spermatogonia. And they are diploid, so they have 46 chromosomes. What happens um, is that as the spermatogonia divide, they produce cells that begin to enter meiosis. And by the time meiosis 1 and 2 complete, what will happen for each spermatogonia enters meiosis is it will make four haploid sperm that are not yet capable of swimming until they leave the seminiferous tubules and are conveyed um, from the seminiferous tubules to the reed testis and eventually to the epididymis which is where they're going to become capable of using their flagella and from there that point on um, when they're bound to be part of the ejaculate what will happen is that a combination of smooth muscle contraction and also um, ciliary movement in the vas deferens will sweep the sperm um, ultimately uh, through the vas deferens past the seminal vesicle again the secretions from the seminal vesicle will merge with the sperm at that point along with the secretions of the prostate will then enter the prostatic urethra um, we'll head from there to the membranous urethra, to the penile urethra, um, picking up the secretions from the bulbal urethral glands along the way, and then we'll exit the body. Now, one of the things that you should notice about um, the testes is that they hang outside the body. And the reason for this is that we need a temperature slightly lower than body temperature in order for sperm production to proceed at the optimal rate. And so there's two muscles called the cremaster muscle and the dartos muscle which can either raise or lower the testes depending on the temperature outside. 
If it's warm outside, the testes will tend to hang away from the body. If it's cold outside, the testes will tend to draw near the body. And then the point is to try and keep the temperature of the testes around 35 degrees or so. In order to cool the testes, you'll notice that the testicular artery, which is part of the spermatic cord, runs past a network of blood vessels called the pampiform plexus and what this does is it acts as a heat exchanger cooling the arterial blood before it reaches the testy and as a result helping to keep the temperature inside the organ a little bit cooler than normal. You'll also notice that the spermatic cord contains in addition to the pampiform plexus and testicular artery a nerve and of course the vas deferens itself. The entire structure actually starts inside the abdominal pelvic cavity when the male is still in his mother's womb and what happens as um, the, the fetus matures to a neonate is that the testes will drop through an opening in the abdominal pelvic cavity called the inguinal canal guided by a tendon called the gubernaculum which is seated at the bottom of the scrotum which will slowly pull the um, testy into the scrotal sac. In a small percentage of cases, the testes fail to descend, and that's a condition called cryptochitism. But what has to be done in that case is that the testy has to be rescued from inside the abdominal pelvic cavity and moved into the scrotum in order for sperm production to proceed at an optimal rate. What you're looking at here is just our model of the male reproductive system. This is the fetal pig here on the left. But concern yourselves primarily with the model here. You can see the testy, the epididymis, this whole thing is the spermatic cord and the vas deferens are inside this cord. Okay, um, This is the scrotum Okay, here. Um, and then you can also see um, the organ here, the penis, and of course the urethra. Um, the part that you're seeing here is the penile or the spongy urethra. Now one of the things that we should point out um, while we're looking at the male reproductive system is the fact that part of the urethra um, passes through the prostate gland. Um, it's a little tough to see on this particular model. Um, you can see the prostate gland right there. The prostate gland begins approximately the size of a walnut um, in in a, uh, a male in his teenage years but as a lot of men age what can happen is that the prostate can begin to enlarge and in some cases can reach the size of a softball or a grapefruit in men that are say 55 or older and the problem of course with that is that they can block off the passage of urine from the bladder into the urethra and so what has to be done if that happens, that's a condition called prostatitis, is that the um, portion of the urethra that passes through that gland has to be cored out, has to be opened up in order to restore flow. Otherwise, as the urine builds up in the bladder, the pressure will back up into the ureters, which will back up into the kidney. And ultimately what will happen is that you'll damage the kidney. What you're looking at here is just another peek at our model. You can see the testes, the penis, the epididymis where the sperm learn to swim, swim the spermatic cord here which contains the vas deferens, the, the um, testicular artery, vein and nerve. Notice that it passes from outside the body cavity back into the body cavity and then it's going to rejoin the urethra along with the seminal vesicle at the ejaculatory duct. You can see here the seminal vesicle and the prostate. This is the ureter. Okay, this is a portion of the colon right here, um, and um, you can also see, of course, the scrotum, the glands, the shaft of the penis as well. Okay, and this is just a bifurcated penis um, looking from the dorsal aspect. So we're looking from the superior view down. Okay, so this would be the the top of the penis. And what we've done is we've we've cut it open 
and uh, butterfly it so that you can see some of the other structures. But you can pick up here the bladder, the ampulla of the vas deferens, there's the seminal vesicle, the prostate gland, the bulbo-urethral gland, the bulb of the penis. These are the corpora, sponge, or, uh, corpora cavernosa. Okay, there's one on the left and the right dorsal aspect of the penis. This is the corpora spongiosum. Okay, and this is the the penile urethra here, the membranous urethra, and of course the prostatic urethra, of course the bladder, the ureters, the vas deferens, the epididymis, and the testis. Now you might be asking yourself, okay, what's the significance of the corpora cavernosa and spongiosa? What they do is they are critical for erection of the penis. What happens when the male becomes aroused is that the rate of blood flow into these three columns of vascularized tissue is faster than the rate of blood flow out. And so what happens is that a, a hydrostatic mechanism causes the organ to become erect and it's so available for intermission. One of the things that we have to understand about meiosis is that for every spermatogonia, every diploid cell that enters meiosis, we're going to end up generating four haploid sperm. And if you take a cross-section through a seminiferous tubule, what you actually see is a developmental sequence going from diploid cells to cells that are in meiosis 1 to cells that are in meiosis 2 to cells that are beginning to differentiate into spermatids and from there into spermatozoa. And so if you look at the lumen of the seminiferous tubules, what you'll see are flagella um, indicating the presence of, ma of mature sperm who cannot yet swim. Okay, So what happens in the seminiferous tubules is that a spermatogonial cell will divide mitotically. One cell from that mitotic division will remain a spermatogonium. The other cell will begin to enter meiosis. Okay, um, What will happen first at meiosis 1, of course, is that look-alike chromosomes will pair up and exchange genetic material um, at metaphase meiosis 1. Um, then the reductional division will take place at anaphase meiosis 1, followed by um, telophase. And at that point, what you'll have are two uh, cells with half the number of chromosomes as the original. Um, what will happen next is that meiosis 2 will begin, okay, um, the, the chromosomes will line up along the metaphase plate, um, they will then divide, this is called the equational division, and what you'll end up with is four haploid spermatids, which will then begin to differentiate into um, cells that look more like a spermatozoa, but are still not yet capable of swimming, and eventually what will happen is they'll become sperm that have all the equipment necessary to fertilize an egg but cannot yet use their flagella, not until, again, they become chemically educated in the epididymis. So, um, this happens in the male from puberty until death. So, there's no such thing really as an old sperm cell. Um, that's produced by the testy. Um, sperm are either um, used or reabsorbed, and as a result, um, there's very little chance in the sperm for conditions such as aneuploidy because meiosis is um, something that's completed immediately after mitosis is finished. Following meiosis 1 and 2, all the spermatids are going to have half the amount of DNA as the original spermatogonia, so they're said to be haploid. When they meet up with the egg, what will happen is that the sperm and the egg pronucleus will fuse. The egg will have 23 chromosomes, the sperm will have 23 chromosomes, and when those two nuclei get back together, the diploid state of 46 chromosomes will be satisfied, and that basically is the beginning of a new human life. What you're looking at next is an actual sperm cell. You can see here 
the flagella, okay, the midpiece, which has a lot of mitochondria in it. Um, and you can also see here the head, which contains the genetic material, as well as the acrosome. So what's the purpose of each of these different parts? Well, the acrosome contains proteolytic enzymes that can digest through the corona radiata and zona pellucida that surround the egg as it pops out of the ovary um, at ovulation. It takes the combined action of many acrosomal uh, enzyme packets to ultimately get all the way down to the egg cell membrane where the sperm membrane and the egg membrane can fuse. And the egg is set up in such a way that one and only one sperm is capable of fertilization of the egg. When that first sperm that makes it to the egg cell membrane fuses with it, what will happen is that the egg will chemically lock out the other sperm and although they'll remain attached to the outer surface of the egg, their genetic material won't be um, able to get into the cytoplasm and fuse with the nucleus. But those sperm are still important because they'll help paddle the egg down the fallopian tube and ultimately to the uterus. Of course, the genetic material is the father's contribution to the baby's DNA. And then the midpiece is the engine that drives the movement of the tail. There's lots of mitochondria in here. There's also centrioles. And, of course, the tail is the, um, the structure that allows the sperm to swim. The energy actually comes from components in the semen, fructose being one of the major components that provides energy for the long trip from the tip of the penis all the way um, to the fallopian tube where the egg may very well be. So what you see in a sperm cell is a very tiny cell which is essentially an optimized gene delivery vehicle. That's why it's, it's a relatively tiny lightweight cell because um, it has a long journey and um, we don't want to have to worry about unnecessary structures and extra weight that would otherwise um, inhibit the sperm from getting all the way to the egg. Now, how is it that the endocrine system controls sperm production? Well, it begins in the hypothalamus of the brain. <clears throat> Hormones are released from here into a, a set of capillary beds that's part of a structure called the hypophysial hypothalamic portal system. These releasing factors, the main one being gonadotropin releasing hormone, are conveyed to the anterior pituitary, and this causes the anterior pituitary to release gonadotropin. The, the gonadotropin um, that we're concerned with here is one called LH, which stands for luteinizing hormone. This travels to the testis and um, promotes um, the secretion of testosterone by cells in the testis. Follicle stimulating hormone is also released by the pituitary and travels to the testis as well. Luteinizing hormone is going to stimulate testosterone production, so testosterone levels increase, while follicle stimulating hormone stimulates sperm production, so the number of sperm in increase. For sperm development to occur, the testosterone levels have to be relatively high. There will be negative feedback when there are too many sperm. So we have a volume control on sperm production um, so that we're not making gametes when we don't actually need to use them. Now the female reproductive anatomy is very different. This is a sagittal section through a female pelvic region. And what you can see here are several structures. <coughs> the ovary, the fallopian tube, which leads into the uterus. This is the uterus. This is the bladder and the urethra. This is the vagina and the cervix. This is the external um, opening. And this is the internal opening um, into the cervix. And this is, this is called the cervical canal. Then there's three layers of tissue in the uterus that are important. 
the parametrium, the outer layer here, the myometrium, which is smooth muscle, and the endometrium, which is responsible for nourishing the baby during the three trimesters of development, which is the inner layer. And then, of course, you can see the colon, the rectum, and the anus. Okay, there's the pubic symphysis. You can see the labia majora, which is made from the same tissue in the female as the scrotum is in the male, and the labia minora. There is the clitoris, which is the female counterpart to the penis, except that there is no urethra in the organ, but it has erectile tissue just like the penis does, and you can see, of course, the urethra. So in the female, there are three openings. You've got the urethra, the vagina, and, of course, the anus. The greater vestibular gland is responsible for lubricating the vestibule so that um, intercourse um, is a lot more comfortable. And uh, what happens essentially when um, intercourse is occurring is that the sperm are introduced into the vagina and then they begin their journey um, from the tip of the penis up through the vagina into the uterus through the uterus into the fallopian tube and from the fallopian tube all the way to the ampulla and then generally if there's an egg around the sperm will find it and fertilize it. There's several ligaments that hold the uterus and the fallopian tubes and the ovary in place. The round ligament, the uterosacral ligament, the suspensory and ovarian ligaments and the broad ligament. Okay. Um, very important in stabilizing the position of the organ. Notice that the uterus is on top of the bladder. This is why in mothers who are getting uh, rather late in development, the baby's getting big, several things happen. Number one, the baby starts to do a headstand on top of the bladder, and this causes increased urinary urgency in the mother. Uh, the baby also pushes um, abdominal pelvic organs out of the way, this can result in problems with um, the functioning of the digestive tract and also the baby pushes up on the diaphragm and it makes it hard um, for the mother to um, breathe with the same vital capacity she had before the baby began to develop. You can see here the pubic symphysis as well. The pubic symphysis is a critical joint for the baby to pass through the birth canal because the cartilage between the pubis um, is acted on by a hormone called relaxin which softens it and allows um, a little bit of expansion of the uh, the pelvic outlet and inlet uh, when the baby begins to crown so that it's easier to deliver. So here you can see the path of the egg. We go from the ovary to the uterine or fallopian tube to the uterus um, and then if we implant right if we've been fertilized and we implant what will happen is that for the three trimesters of development um, the zygote will develop into a blastocyst which will develop um, into eventually an embryo which will develop into a fetus which will develop into a neonate and then the neonate will be expelled through the birth canal into the outside world. If the egg is not fertilized, what will happen is it will go from ovary to fallopian tube to uterus um, through the internal cervical opening, through the cervical canal, through the external cervical opening, and then it will pass uh, through the vagina and into the outside world. One of the things that you want to make sure to do is get a look at uh, what ovarian tissue looks like um, in the female so that you know uh, what an egg and a follicle are. Okay, One of the things that we need to note about the female anatomy which makes it special um, is that as we look here at this model the female is born um, with all the eggs she's ever going to have and all that happens as she ages is that um, she ovulates eggs and uh, the follicle will either shoot the egg into the fallopian tube at ovulation or um, the follicle uh, will end up dying in a process called atresia. Essentially every month uh, during the female's reproductive life which runs 
from menarche, which is her first menstrual period, to menopause, which is when the last egg leaves the ovary, is that in one of the other ovaries, two dozen follicles, each with an egg inside them, are picked to begin to mature. And of those two dozen, one will become fully mature um, at the end of that ovarian cycle, and the other 23 will die through a process called atresia. So as the woman ages, her follicle count begins to drop, and also um, the production of estrogen from the ovary will begin to decline the older she gets because the follicles are um, responsible for secreting estrogen and progesterone. The egg um, will eventually uh, erupt from its mature follicle and take with it a cloak of follicle cells called the corona radiata, which are meant to disguise the egg from the woman's own immune system. Uh, this is important because you have to remember that the eggs a woman produces are going to be antigenically distinct from the rest of her body cells due to the fact that there has been a rearrangement of genetic material during the course of meiosis which can result in differences in antigens that are on the egg surface. So we have to um, protect these eggs so that they're not attacked as foreign bodies. The sperm, if they're around, have to work their way through the corona radiata and the zona pellucida, which is extracellular material deep to the corona radiata and superficial to the egg cell membrane that protects the egg from these outside forces. Once again, one particular lucky sperm makes it all the way to the egg cell membrane, then the sperm and egg pronucleus will fuse, fertilization will have occurred, the rest of the sperm will be locked out, and then the egg at that point, uh, when the nuclei fuse, will be termed a zygote. The zygote will begin to divide rapidly, forming a morula, which will eventually form a hollow ball of cells called a blastula, which will eventually implant into the uterine lining, once it gets there, uh, in the in, into the endometrium, forming an embryonic disc, which will eventually form an embryo, which will eventually form a fetus, and that eventually will lead to the neonate. So you can see the different structures here. Uh, you can pick up the ovary and the fallopian tube and the uterus, the cervix, the vagina, the urethra, the bladder, the uh, anus, and the rectum, and the colon. Okay, So remember those structures to be able to identify them. What you're looking at here is a little bit of a misleading picture of the internal structures of the female reproductive system. As you have seen in the previous model photographs, the uterus is um, tilted forward, uh, leaning over the top of the bladder. So it's not standing straight up as you might think if you were to look at this particular picture. But it does show you the relevant structures along with the ligaments that hold them in place. So you can see here the vagina and the cervix, um, the um, external and internal opening in the cervical canal, uh, again the three layers of tissue, the parametrium on the outside, the myometrium in the middle, and the endometrial layer. There's the fundus, there's the body, and there's the isthmus. Okay, And you can see the two fallopian tubes, one here and one there. Okay. Um, there's the ovary, the fallopian tube, and of course leading into the uterus. And then you can see the ligaments. There's the ovarian and the round ligament down here, the uterosacral, and then the broad ligament, and then the suspensory ligament, all designed to hold them in place. There are nerves and blood vessels running through uh, these ligaments that supply um, blood to the organ. Um, there's this very special set of blood vessels that supply blood to the endometrium and it's the periodic choking off of certain blood vessels that supply the endometrium with oxygen and nutrients that triggers menses, basically the death of this inner lining which is shed out with the menstrual flow monthly throughout the female's reproductive life, um, again of course until menopause.
what you can see here is just a sagittal section through the female pelvic region again um, be able to identify the ovary vagina urethra uterus and bladder know the difference between them know what they do okay you can see here the pubic symphysis as well um, and you can also pick up of course the rectum and the anus the vagina the urethra bladder the uterus the ovary and the fallopian tube this is just a repeat looking essentially at the same structures um, don't concern yourself so much with the fetal pig since we didn't get a chance to do that dissection in lab just concentrate primarily on the models now in the female reproductive system uh, we have to be aware of a couple of things one is the maturation of the egg during the ovarian cycle and the other is the maturation of the follicle which is the chamber inside which the egg sits while it's in the ovary so before birth what happens is that oogonia divide rapidly by mitosis and make lots and lots of uh, stem cells that are going to produce eggs and then what happens uh, during childhood the, the woman is born with millions of um, of oogonia inside the ovary what will happen when puberty begins is that a set of primary oocytes um, a set of well a set of oogonia will graduate to um, primary oocytes um, based on hormonal signals that come ultimately from the pituitary gland remember that in one or the other ovary two dozen of these oogonia will graduate to primary oocyte status what will happen is that um, they'll stay arrested in prophase meiosis one so they will have swapped genetic material at this point and are waiting for two events in order to complete meiosis um, one is um, ovulation and the other is fertilization and until that happens these um, chromosomes will stay in a state of having exchanged genetic material but not having completed the meiotic division Meiosis 1 is completed by one primary oocyte each month under signals that come from the anterior pituitary. Okay, so um, once she's, she's, she's uh, left childhood, these oogonia okay, are already uh, arrested in prophase 1. Okay, and that goes for every um, oogonia in the ovary. And, this is why um, there's concern about women who try to become mothers after the age of 30 or so because the longer these eggs sit um, in the middle of prophase 1 the more likely they are to fail to complete meiosis properly and that's of course the big danger um, this is why um, very old eggs if they fail to complete meiosis will come up with an incorrect chromosome count and when they're fertilized by a sperm that carries 23 chromosomes the result can be um, a zygote with an odd number of chromosomes and this can adversely affect the way the baby develops so this is why incidents of Down syndrome, Kleinfelters and Turner syndrome are more frequent in older mothers what happens with the monthly cycle is that meiosis 1 will be completed by one primary oocyte monthly out of the 24 that were selected and the rest um, will the rest of the oocytes will die through a process called atresia what will happen when that oocyte um, attempts to complete meiosis 1 is that at the first meiotic division there will be um, a normal sized cell produced but also 
a cell with a lot less cytoplasm that's called a polar body and this will eventually degrade, disappear. At the second meiotic division a polar body, a second polar body will be produced and that will disappear. So the result of um, the completion of meiosis II um, in the event that this egg is ovulated and it's fertilized is going to be a single ovum for every oogonia that enters meiosis I and runs all the way through meiosis II unlike in the male where we're going to end up generating four haploid sperm for every spermatogonia that enters meiosis. Okay, so that's a significant difference. Three quarters of the potential genetic products uh, are never going to be part of a viable gamete. Okay, these, these guys will all disappear. Now at the same time um, we have to be aware of what's going on in the chamber inside which the egg sits, which is the follicle. We start out as primordial follicles and then um, graduate to primary follicle status uh, and then during childhood the ovary remains inactive but once puberty hits again a certain a number of primary follicles will be chosen to mature under the influence of follicle stimulating hormone what will happen is that fluid will accumulate between the follicle cells and the ovum and the number of follicle cells surrounding the egg will increase what will eventually happen is as the fluid continues to fill uh, this chamber which is now called the antrum is that the follicle will become more and more fragile and then finally um, just after a surge of follicle stimulating and luteinizing hormone along with the mechanical action of the fringed tips of the fallopian tube stroking the surface of the ovary is that this follicle will pop and this haploid cell will um, exit the ovary in the act of ovulation and be sucked into the fallopian tube where if there are sperm around it can be fertilized and then it can work its way eventually to the uterus um, as a result of the current created by the cells that line the fallopian tube which are ciliated and constantly beat towards the uterus and also the whipping action of the flagella of the sperm in the event that there are uh, sperm around to attempt to fertilize the gamete. So mitosis of the oogonia while the female still inside her mother's uterus produces lots and lots of diploid cells. Meiosis one then starts but then it will stop. Okay, uh, Genetic variation is introduced at this point because Lookalike chromosomes will pair up and exchange genetic material um, between the um, maternal and paternal copies of each chromosome. There will be about 2 million primary oocytes um, between birth and puberty that potentially um, could be uh, capable of producing an egg that can be fertilized. All the primary oocytes are surrounded by cells and form primary follicles that will remain in suspended animation until puberty begins. And when that begins is going to depend on the female. Anywhere from 10 to 14 is the average, but there are extraordinary cases where it can start much younger or much later. With the onset of puberty, every 28 days, a few of the primary follicles undergo meiosis one. Um, and then meiosis II, which will um, not completely uh, complete until two events, ovulation and fertilization, takes place. So the primary oocyte at that point becomes a secondary oocyte. The secondary oocyte is then released by the ovary. Meiosis II is then completed after ovulation and fertilization by the sperm. Okay, and, and remember again that three quarters of the potential meiotic products are discarded as polar bodies. Okay, so you can see in the diagram um, which events are happening where. Okay, uh, remember that um, 
it's critical to understand that this suspended animation which begins um, from age 10 uh, to 14 is going to continue um, for all the follicles until they are chosen for maturation, ovulation, and fertilization, which is why the longer they sit in this stage, the greater the potential for um, a mistake to happen in meiosis. What you're looking at here is just the course of events that occurs inside the ovary. We're following here a developmental sequence um, that uh, ensues when we start with the earliest possible um, structure that contains the egg, the primary follicle, which then graduates to a mature follicle. You can see here that the number of uh, cells surrounding the egg increase. Again, this is under the influence of follicle stimulating hormone. Uh, as the fluid begins to build up inside the follicle, uh, the egg will eventually feature a, a structure called an antrum uh, with a corona radiata, of course, surrounding the egg and um, the follicle becoming easier and easier to pop. And eventually what will happen um, when the fimbrae um, mechanically rupture uh, this outer layer of the follicle is the egg will emerge in the act of ovulation and then the remaining follicular cells will form a yellow body called the corpus luteum and the job of the corpus luteum is to produce hormones that will prepare the endometrium for the arrival of the potentially fertilized egg by causing it to thicken and this is uh, accomplished by the production of estrogen and progesterone uh, which contribute now to um, the thickening of the endometrial lining it will engorge with blood and also nutrients once the egg arrives at the uterus eventually a structure will form called the chorion which is essentially what connects the developing embryo to the uterine lining and the chorion will produce a hormone called human chorionic gonadotropin or HCG which is what's detected in pregnancy tests which will in turn keep the corpus luteum viable for the first one and a half trimesters or so so as long as the chorion is producing HCG and the corpus luteum is producing estrogen and progesterone the endometrium will stay engorged with nutrients and it'll support the pregnancy. Eventually what will happen is that the, um, the human chorionic gonadotropin uh, will cease being made. At that point, the placenta will take over the job of producing hormones that maintain the endometrium, and the corpus luteum will then begin to devolve into this white body called the corpus albicans, which is basically a a scar on the uterus that's no longer an endocrine organ and at that point um, the production of estrogen and progesterone from that structure ceases and so you can see that as a woman goes through this cycle every month for her reproductive life the number of follicles that produce hormone decrease in a stepwise fashion um, eventually to the point where there are no follicles left to generate significant amounts of estrogen and progesterone and at that point often what we have to do is we have to replace the lost hormone artificially either as an oral or as an injectable in a process called hormone replacement therapy so you can see up here every 28 days the primary follicle undergoes meiosis 1 which was actually begun uh, back before puberty began and meiosis 2 which starts and then stops until the egg is both ovulated and fertilized. The primary oocyte will become the secondary oocyte which will then be released by the ovary. And what you're looking at here is just the fluctuation of hormones that are responsible for the maturation 
of the follicle and ultimately um, the act of ovulation. So you can see that right before the egg is about to pop out, there's a spike of luteinizing and follicle stimulating hormone from the anterior pituitary that trigger the um, events in the ovary that lead to the release of the egg, which is then going to be sucked up by the fallopian tube and hopefully fertilized if there are sperm in the area. So you can see here um, the different parts of the cycle. Okay, It's a 28-day cycle. And um, what you can see here is that on day zero, we end menses from the previous cycle. There is a primary follicle that's going to be stimulated, again, by FSH. And then by day 14, we see ovulation occur as a result of this spike in follicle-stimulating and luteinizing hormone. And then these levels begin to fall, okay, over the next 14 days. Um, and the reason for that is that we don't want to trigger the maturation of another follicle um, while we're trying to fertilize and implant the original ovulated gamete. Okay. And what you're looking at here are just the hormonal interactions of the female cycle. Um, structural changes in the follicles during the cycle are correlated with changes in the endometrium of the uterus during the cycle. So there's a couple of phases here, the follicular and the luteal phase, that are divided by the act of ovulation. Okay? In the follicular phase, what's happening is that estrogen and progesterone are being produced by the follicle, which are causing the uterine lining to thicken as a result primarily of mitosis. At ovulation, of course, the follicle transitions into the corpus luteum as the egg is released and then the corpus luteum is going to produce estrogen and progesterone which will at that point cause the lining to thicken not because of primarily mitotic division but because of the accumulation of nutrients and um, um, blood vessels in the endometrial lining in preparation for the arrival of what will by that time be the blastocyst in the event that the egg is fertilized. Okay, so you can see here the follicular phase, ovulation, and of course the luteal phase. And this is just showing you the sequence of events that maintains the amount of genetic material in the nucleus from generation to generation. We are diploid organisms. We get 23 chromosomes from our father and 23 from our mother and that provides a unique collection of DNA which generates an organism that is similar but not exactly like either one of the parents. In addition to that, remember that the genetic material you get from your mother and your father is slightly rearranged as a result of genetic exchange that, it, that takes place during metaphase meiosis one. And so you truly are a unique combination of DNA that's not found in either of the parents. The male gamete, of course, is the sperm, which contains 23 chromosomes. Um, and the female gamete is the egg, which also contains 23 chromosomes. Remember that the sex of the child is determined by the male gamete. It either will contain an X or a Y chromosome. If the male gamete contains a Y chromosome, we will have a male child. If it contains an X, we will have a female child. All eggs only contain the X chromosome as the sex chromosome. Fertilization then occurs. We restore the diploid state, and now we're capable of generating a new human being with a unique set of genes. If this didn't happen, the number of chromosomes would increase every generation without meiosis, and eventually what would happen is that the nucleus would get so large that it wouldn't be able to contain all the genetic material and in addition to that, the gene dosage would change to the point where the enzymes and cell signaling molecules that control development would be produced in the wrong amounts in the wrong place in the wrong time. And this would perturb development to the point where um, 
it could result in defects so severe that development doesn't even complete and that can result in what we call a spontaneous abortion and what you're looking at here is just um, the sequence of events from uh, primordial to primary to secondary follicle to mature follicle to release of the egg okay um, once the egg is out um, it will then um, continue meiosis 2 once the sperm find it meiosis 2 will complete and then the egg and sperm pronucleus will fuse now we have a zygote which will eventually work its way to the uterus and then eventually implant and at that point um, the process of differentiation and growth to develop all the different organ systems can occur nourished by the blood and the um, nutrients that are in the endometrial lining for the three trimesters of the pregnancy. Here you can see how we prepare the uterus for the blastocyst. Um, notice here that um, we have a, a big kick up in progesterone levels as soon as the as the uh, corpus luteum is formed. Um, you can see the estrogen levels beginning to climb uh, through the follicular phase. Okay, Then we have a slight drop and then that's followed by another rise during the um, the secretory phase. You can see the dramatic rise in progesterone during the secretory phase. It's these two hormones together that help to thicken the uterine lining in preparation for the arrival of the blastocyst. Notice that the um, surge of FSH and LH occurs right around this point. Okay, So you can see here the dramatic effect that that has on the production of estrogen and progesterone by the, uh, the ovary. And what you're looking at here are just the different phases that the endometrium goes through um, during the uterine cycle. So here is the end of the previous cycle. Here is the proliferative phase. You can see the endometrium beginning to thicken. And then, of course, ovulation occurs. Okay? And then um, we have the secretory phase where the thickening of the endometrial lining is the result primarily of the accumulation of um, extracellular components and blood vessels okay by the time the blastocyst arrives at the uterus the endometrium is thickened to the point where um, it can implant and it can be sustained for the three tri trimesters of pregnancy um, if there is no blastocyst if there is no fertilization what will happen as a result is that there will be no chorionic gonadotropin produced. The corpus luteum will um, turn into the corpus albicans, and at that point we'll have an immediate drop in the production of estrogen and progesterone, which will trigger menses, and the result then will be the end of that particular cycle. Okay, so it all depends on whether or not we get an implantation. And you can see here just the description of the different um, portions of the uterine cycle and how they're controlled by what's going on in the ovary. And here you can see um, what happens if there is no fertilization, right? No fertilization. What happens here? The oocyte arrives. There is no chorion produced. There is no um, maintenance. Uh, there is no ability to maintain the corpus luteum it becomes the corpus albicans the drop in estrogen and progesterone trigger the menstrual flow okay um, stay tuned because uh, I've got a couple of videos that uh, really explain this very nicely um, and again make sure and review this material as it will be covered on the upcoming practical and uh, final exam to understand the various ways that medical science can assist reproduction, 
It is important to understand how the reproductive system functions in both sexes because the cause of infertility often lies equally with both men and women. The main players in the female reproductive cycle are the pituitary gland, the ovaries and the uterus. Their activities are closely coordinated. Each month, one or other ovary releases a single egg, an event known as ovulation. It is brought about by a series of complex interactions between the pituitary gland, the ovaries, and the uterus. The pituitary gland is itself under the control of this small area of the brain known as the hypothalamus. A new menstrual cycle begins when the nerve cells of this center secrete a hormone called gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, GNRH, into the network of blood vessels which surrounds the pituitary gland. Stimulated by pulses of gonadotrophin-releasing hormone, cells in the pituitary gland secrete another hormone, follicle-stimulating hormone, or FSH. FSH travels in the bloodstream, reaching the ovaries. There it stimulates the formation and growth of an ovarian follicle in one or other ovary. The follicle consists of an egg, a number of surrounding cells which secrete estrogen hormones, and fluid. FSH helps the egg to mature and prepares it for release. As the follicle matures, the hypothalamus increases secretion of GnRH. This in turn stimulates the pituitary to secrete a second hormone which acts on the ovary. This is luteinizing hormone, or LH. Toward the middle of the cycle, there is a sudden peak in the blood level of LH. This acts as the trigger for ovulation. Within minutes of its release, the egg is guided by suction through the fringed opening of the outer end of the fallopian tube, starting it on a journey which will take five or six days as it passes down the tube and finally reaches the cavity of the uterus. Meanwhile, after the follicle ruptures, it is converted into this yellowish body known as the corpus luteum. Cells of the corpus luteum secrete the hormone progesterone, which brings about important changes in the lining of the uterus, preparing it for possible pregnancy. In fact, the lining of the uterus, known as the endometrium, undergoes changes in response to hormone levels during the cycle. In the first half of the cycle, known as the follicular phase, the developing follicle secretes increasing amounts of estrogen hormone which encourages regeneration of the endometrium. After ovulation, there are important changes in the endometrium, aimed at making it suitable to receive a fertilized egg. These changes are brought about by a secretion of progesterone from the corpus luteum. The secretion of progesterone is maintained for several days, but if the egg is not fertilized in that time, the corpus luteum withers and falling levels of progesterone and estrogen trigger the shedding of the uterine lining as the menstrual flow. The cycle then starts again. But if the egg is fertilized, no menstruation occurs as the corpus luteum continues to function, secreting progesterone during the first three months of the pregnancy. Thereafter, numerous changes occur to support the developing embryo. The major structures of the female reproductive system are the two ovaries, two fallopian tubes, the uterus, and the vagina. A normal female is capable of reproducing from the onset of menstruation during puberty until the end of menopause. The female is fertile and able to become pregnant approximately during the 13th and 14th days of each menstrual cycle. The total number of eggs a woman will produce in her lifetime are present in her ovaries when she is born. Each month at the beginning of a menstrual cycle, the pituitary gland secretes the follicle-stimulating hormone, which is commonly known as FSH. This hormone stimulates one egg to mature with an ovary. The maturing egg is surrounded by a graphene follicle. On the 13th or 14th day of the menstrual cycle, the graphene follicle ruptures and releases the mature egg from the ovary. Because the fallopian tube is not attached to the ovary, 
the finger-like fimbriae must catch the egg and guide it into the fallopian tube. After the release of the egg, the graphene follicle changes and becomes the corpus luteum, which secretes the hormone progesterone in preparation of the lining of the uterus to support a pregnancy. If the egg is not fertilized, the corpus luteum dies and the progesterone secretion ceases. The menstrual cycle is then completed with a menstrual period. If the egg is fertilized as it travels down the fallopian tube, the corpus luteum continues to produce progesterone. The fertilized egg moves into the uterus where it is implanted. The placenta forms and, for the duration of the pregnancy, it secretes the progesterone required to maintain the pregnancy. Throughout the 40 weeks of the pregnancy, necessary nutrients are supplied and waste products are removed by the placenta and the umbilical cord. When it is time for the baby to be born, the pituitary gland secretes the hormone oxytocin. This hormone stimulates the labor contractions that result in the birth of the child. After the infant has been delivered, the final stage is the delivery of the placenta as the afterbirth. Under the regulation of the pituitary hormones, luteinizing hormone, LH, and follicle-stimulating hormone, FSH, follicles develop within the ovary. Primordial, primary, and secondary follicles contain an oocyte that is suspended in prophase of the first meiotic division. Growth in these follicles is due to an increase in the number of granulosa cells. Secondary follicles develop an antrum that contains the secretions of the granulosa cells. Within the mature follicle, the first meiotic division is completed. A sharp increase in the LH level stimulates ovulation. After ovulation, the remaining granulosa cells and surrounding cells form a corpus luteum. If pregnancy occurs, the corpus luteum is maintained. If pregnancy does not occur, the corpus luteum slowly degenerates to form a corpus albicans. The primary role of the male reproductive system is to produce and deliver sperm to fertilize an egg in the female. These sperm are produced outside of the body cavity by the testicles, which are located in the scrotum. The scrotum protects and supports the male reproductive organs that are located outside of the body cavity. These include the testicles, epididymis, and vas deferens. The testicles produce about 300 million sperm each day. However, this is possible only if the temperature of the testicle is 93.2 degrees Fahrenheit. The scrotum maintains this temperature by adjusting how closely it holds the testicles to the body. The interior of each testicle consists of multiple lobules containing two or three seminiferous tubules. It is within these tubules that sperm formation begins. The sperm moves out of the tubules into the epididymis and then into the vas deferens. The vas deferens carry the sperm upward into the body cavity. After the sperm leaves the vas deferens through the ejaculatory ducts, they pass the openings of the seminal vesicles. The seminal vesicles, which are located near the base of the ejaculatory ducts, secrete a thick yellow substance to nourish the sperm. This secretion forms 60% of the volume of the semen. Semen is the sperm-containing fluid that is ejaculated at the climax of male sexual excitement. From here, the semen travels into the 8-inch long urethra, which transports both urine and semen, but not at the same time. At first, the urethra is surrounded by the prostate gland, and then it is surrounded and protected externally by the penis that is relaxed except during sexual excitement. During sexual excitement, the penis stiffens and enlarges so it can deliver the sperm into the female vagina. During the expelling of the semen, which is known as ejaculation, the prostate gland secretes a thick alkaline fluid that increases the ability of the sperm to move in the semen. Located just below the prostate gland are the bulbo-urethral glands, these glands open into the urethra and, during sexual arousal, they secrete the pre-ejaculate fluid that flushes out any residual urine from the urethra. It also lubricates the urethra to help the sperm pass through. When the male ejaculates into the vagina of the female, the sperm must travel upward through the uterus to fertilize the egg in the fallopian tube. In human females, oogenesis, or egg formation, takes place within the ovaries. Each ovary contains diploid cells called oogonia, derived from embryonic germ cells. Before a woman's birth, the oogonia divide by mitosis. 
the result is more oogonia, some of which develop into primary oocytes. Primary oocytes are immature egg cells contained within masses of cells called follicles. The primary oocytes then enter meiosis I. This process stops uncompleted until puberty. No primary oocytes are formed after this point. At birth, each female has a finite number of primary oocytes available for reproduction. At puberty, a complex series of hormonal events stimulates changes in the surrounding follicle and induces some primary oocytes to complete their first meiotic division. The division of cytoplasm and cell organelles is unequal, however. As a result, one large secondary oocyte and one small polar body form per primary oocyte. The polar body often degenerates. The follicle containing the secondary oocyte continues to mature until a surge of the hormone LH initiates ovulation. The mature follicle ruptures, releasing the secondary oocyte. At this point, the secondary oocyte has entered meiosis II. This second meiotic division will not be completed, however, unless fertilization occurs. The secondary oocyte enters the oviduct, where fertilization of the oocyte with a sperm cell can occur. The entry of a sperm cell into the cytoplasm of the secondary oocyte triggers the completion of meiosis II. The cytoplasm divides unequally, generating a mature ovum and a second polar body. The fusion of the haploid sperm cell and the haploid egg cell has produced a diploid zygote. Spermatogonia are the cells from which sperm cells arise. The spermatogonia divide by mitosis. One daughter cell remains a spermatogonium, and the other becomes a primary spermatocyte. The primary spermatocyte divides by meiosis to form secondary spermatocytes. Secondary spermatocytes divide again to form spermatids. The spermatids differentiate into sperm cells. Let's compare spermatogenesis with oogenesis. Both processes start before birth, when embryonic germ cells differentiate into spermatogonia in the testis of a male, or oogonia in the ovary of a female. Both types of cells are diploid. However, whereas mitotic divisions continue to generate new spermatogonia in the male until death, in the female, the generation of more oogonia by mitosis halts well before birth. Although spermatogonia develop into primary spermatocytes throughout life in the male, in the female some oogonia develop into primary oocytes, but only before birth. Males can continue to produce viable sperm from puberty until death, but females can produce viable eggs only from puberty until the supply of primary oocytes is depleted. Meiosis I does not begin until puberty in the testis of the male. Meiosis I begins before birth and ends at puberty in the ovary of the female. Meiosis II occurs within the testis at any time from puberty until death in the male. Meiosis II begins within the ovary only at ovulation in the female and ends within the oviduct upon fertilization by a sperm cell. The final result of spermatogenesis is four haploid sperm cells for each spermatogonium. In contrast, Oogenesis can result in one egg cell and two polar bodies for each oogonium, but only if fertilization has occurred.